Good morning and welcome to the annual conference of the Asia Project at the Robert Schumann Center of the European University Institute. My name is Eric Jones and I'm director of the European or <laughs> I'm director of the Robert Schumann Center. Uh, and, and, and so I'm very happy to be opening this event. Uh, this is an event that is being organized uniquely in cooperation with the University of California at San Diego and with the generous support of the Japan Foundation. Um, the subject that we're gonna focus on today uh, is the geopolitics and economics of technology uh, in the Indo-Pacific, security, prosperity, and values. In this opening session, uh, we have the great pleasure to offer three pre-recorded welcomes from important institutional figures and, and much more important to us, uh, this wonderful presentation by Professor Marie Soderberg uh, from, <clears throat> from the European uh, Institute of Japanese Studies. Um, now I'm gonna introduce each of these speakers in turn, uh, then provide an introduction for Professor Soderberg. Uh, and if there's time left at the end of the session, we'll be able to engage directly with Professor Soderberg uh, on the basis of her contribution. The first of the introductory remarks that we would like to offer is from the European Commissioner for the Internal Market, uh, Mr. Thierry Breton. So I'll hand over to him now. Ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, very happy to be able to address uh, such a uh, distinguished uh, audience today. The dual focus of uh, our discussion today on technological transformation and cooperation with the Indo-Pacific region in a context of increasing geopolitical instability and tension is a topical issue and remains so despite the instability and the war at the heart of Europe. Technologies play a very central role in our respective regions and technological cooperation between the EU and our like-minded partners in Indo-Pacific regions is a crucial element of our joint response to the challenges we jointly face. The Indo-Pacific region is uh, pivotal due to its growing economic, demographic, and also, of course, political weight. It is uh, also highly interconnected with the EU. Together, for example, we hold over 70% of the global trade in goods and services, as well as over 60% of foreign direct investment flows. However, current dynamics in the Indo-Pacific have given uh, rise to intense geopolitical competition, adding to increasing tensions on trade and supply chains, as well as challenges in technological, political, and security areas. One of these challenges is to achieve resilient and reliable supply chain. We will engage with Indo-Pacific partners to build more resilient and sustainable global value chains by diversifying trade and economic relations and by developing technological standards and regulations that are in line with our values and principles. With our recent EU CHIP Act, we will work to improve our own capacity to design and produce powerful and resource-efficient semiconductors. But we will also work with our international partners, and notably from the Indo-Pacific region, to improve the security of supply for semiconductors and avoid uh, future supply chain disruption. We also aim to conclude, uh, still this year, comprehensive digital partnerships with Japan, the Republic of Korea, and Singapore. Our objective is to agree on concrete actions in cutting-edge areas with significant economic potential, such as 5G and 6G, or artificial intelligence, or semiconductor, and to establish a channel of cooperation to address strategic issues affecting the digital transformation. We will also strengthen our dialogue with, ta with Taiwan. Implementing uh, the Global Gateway, we will engage with a broader group of partners in the region to support them in establishing uh, an appropriate regulatory environment and facilitating the mobilization of the necessary funding to improve connectivity on the ground between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. 
Our key objective is to promote connectivity and access to an open and secure internet and to safeguard the EU's and partner countries' digital sovereignty, particularly through the security of digital and data infrastructures and services. In the area of security, we will continue to promote an open and rules-based regional security architecture, also covering cybersecurity, of course. In particular, we will continue to push to strengthen our 5G security. Together with the EU member states, we created the EU toolbox, a, let's say, joint approach for the resilience of uh, 5G networks. And I believe uh, this is an approach uh, which our partners may uh, probably also find uh, uh, hopefully interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, the EU has decided to step up its strategic engagement with the Indo-Pacific region, in particular in the technology field. In implementing our strategy, we are open to work with other key players in the region, including the US, who have their own strategy for the region, and work together to support an open, connected, prosperous and secure region. But we will do that without naivety. A more assertive EU is a positive news, of course, for all our partners. It means we are willing to play our part to address common challenges and also defend our values. In the troubled times uh, we live in, the democratic world must build a common, solid and determined front. More than ever, close cooperation between the EU and Indo-Pacific partners is of essence. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner Breton, for those remarks. Our next institutional welcome will come from Mr. Tadashi Maeda, who's governor of Japan Bank for International Cooperation. distinguished audiences at European University Institute, Dr. Julio Pegris and Professor Taimin Chun. I'm Tadashi Maeda, Governor of Japan Bank for International Cooperation. It is my great pleasure and honor to have a chance to deliver this speech. And I'm very grateful of all of you for this chance. Japan Bank for International Cooperation, JBIC, is a state-owned bank. However, at this bank was managed by the Board of Directors Autonomously, which I chair. And also, we have been expected to be a key player at Free and Open in the Pacific Institute and key uh, institution of the Japanese economic statecraft. Due to the deterioration of the situation, including the pandemic of the COVID-19 and decoupling between the United States and China, and moreover, most recently, the Russian Federation embedded Ukraine on the 24th of February. This is, I believe that it's the saddest moment for Europe. Russian Federation is a mem permanent member of United Nations Security Council and has a veto power. However, the Russia made its decision to disrupt the world peace and order. The Chancellor of Germany, Schultz, immediately made a very strong speech. He said, we face a turning point and Germany for its first time after the World War II, decided to 
send the weapons to Ukraine to protect sovereignty of Ukraine. World has been united, in particular the NATO countries. Japan is not a part of the Europe. However, that we have a very strong concern on the negative impact of what, I, what happened in Europe to, to Asia. And we have been observing that the deterioration of international security order, even in, the, in Asia, South China Sea, and East, and East China Sea. Our government position is very clear that we have, we do not accept any attempt and movement to change the status quo by the forces. Therefore, that the Japanese government already announced that Japan have to stand up and stand by the Ukrainian people. The negative impact has been already appeared. For instance, the prices of the wheat has been skyrocketing and some concerned of disruption of supply chain of semiconductor and critical minerals due to the war in Ukraine. And the very serious, severe sanction was imposed by US, EU, Japan, and member of G7, and other like-minded countries on Russian Federation. Seven banks was, were already excluded from the SWIFT. And the transmitting of the fund are now prohibited in many, in many uh, area in between Russia and other parts of the world. Japanese government, by the way, made a decision right after this invasion, very by coincidence, that the Japanese government, Kishida administration, made a cabinet decision of the economic security bill to be submitted to the national diet for deliberation. Japan is one of the three countries in G20, which do not have the uh, classified patent uh, piece of registration. And the, we do not have enough piece of registration to uh, defend the outflow of sensitive technologies. Therefore, we need to make up uh, this, uh, the gap. Obviously, we are uh, now enforcing this uh, movement. However, our, op our absolute goal is to uh, keep the uh, free and free uh, uh, flows of traffic of the information under the free and democratic world order. But, but the situation is not so easy right now. Also, last year, many countries uh, gathered at Glasgow of G, uh, of COP26, and many countries made a strong commitment or new carbon neutrality by 2050 or other uh, year. Japan is also very strongly committed of the carbon neutrality. This is also a big, big challenge for us. So 
we have to make a tremendous effort to accomplish this goal by the strong partnership among the like-minded countries. JBIC already committed at the Quad process of vaccination, and we made an announcement of financing up to $100 million for strengthening the manufacturing capacity of vaccine against COVID-19 uh, in the India and other part of the world. We are not finalized the, this effort to get out from the pandemic. However, we are pursuing this toward the future. And the young generations, audiences, students of this event, I do hope that you are also strongly committed to this movement and to take the responsibility of the keeping this movement ahead. So we all always, we are always recognizing our duty to succeed this effort to you. And I do hope that this the conference will be very successful and giving you a great opportunity of the many issues we, we may face up and the, uh, this event will be a turning point all of, for all of you to uh, recognize this effort. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Governor Maeda. It's been a great pleasure listening to your inspiring words. Our third introduction is gonna be offered by His Excellency Hiroshi Oe, who's the Japanese ambassador to Italy. Ambassador Oe, over to you. Good morning. My name is Hiroshi Oe, and I'm the ambassador of Japan to Italy, San Marino, and Malta. I'm very honored to be invited to speak at the webinar. The world is now facing the greatest post-war crisis ever. Russia's invasion to Ukraine is clearly a violation of international law. The fact that Russia, who is a permanent member of the Security Council, with primary responsibility for international peace and security, is violating the UN Charter, is inexcusable. Russia is even targeting hospitals and ordinary citizens, and the number of civilians killed is said to be higher than the number of soldiers killed. My heart breaks for the people of Ukraine. I'd like to express my deep condolences to the victims of Russia's barbaric act. I'm recording this message on March 14th, so I just hope the situation will get better by March 21st, but I cannot be very optimistic. It is noteworthy that the international community has shown strong solidarity in response to this crisis and swiftly took action to impose unprecedented level of sanctions, such as the inclusion of selected Russian banks from SWIFT, freezing of assets of persons related to the government of Russia, including President Putin and Russian business oligarch, restricting transactions with the Russian Central Bank, and so on. Economic sanctions are extremely painful for countries imposing sanctions too. Pain could be especially great for Italy and Germany as they depend heavily on Russia for energy. It is remarkable that all G7 countries could 
see a swift agreement on sanctions. Japan also takes part in these sanctions, and although we are an LNG import importing country, we decide to divert LNG to Europe, who heavily depends on Russia for LNG. I'm chair of the IEA governing board, and I'd like to tell you that IEA member countries have unanimously agreed to release 60 million barrels from their emergency reserves to the market. In response to this decision, Japan decided to release 7.5 million barrels, second only to the United States. In fact, I will be in Paris from March 21st to participate in the IEA ministerial meeting on the 23rd and 24th. And that is why I can only attend the webinar on the 21st through a video recording. I talked much about the crisis in Ukraine because this is not something that could only happen in Europe. Similar things can happen in the Asia-Pacific region. The theme of today's webinar, security in the Asia-Pacific region, is an extremely important theme. We must set up a system in this region to cope with any eventuality. Japan has been working hard for a free and open Indo-Pacific FOIP, and we advocate fundamental values such as freedom of navigation and rule of law, peace and prosperity. In the Pacific region accounts for 60% of the global population and GDP, and is the engine of the global economic growth. Japan will work together with the United States, EU, and other value-sharing partners in the variety of areas, including maritime affairs, connectivity, economic security, health, and climate change. In the interest of time, I will only mention a few examples here. On maritime issue, Japan has been providing patrol vessels for many years and working to strengthen law enforcement capabilities in ASEAN countries. We welcome recent moves to dispatch vessels from European countries to the Indo-Pacific and look forward to the strengthening of this, their presence. Some countries are trying to increase political influence through unfair and non-transparent development finance to the developing countries. Japan, the United States, and the EU must contribute to the inclusive and autonomous development of the developing countries in line with the principles for quality infrastructure investment agreed at Osaka G20. Cooperation for economic security is also important. In the current Ukrainian crisis, Russia's cyber attacks against countries imposing sanctions is anticipated to increase. Therefore, cyber security will become increasingly more important, and Japan, United States, and the EU must cooperate to enhance resilience. In Japan, economic security legislation is about to be debated in the Diet. Japan, the United States, and the EU can cooperate in, to eliminate vulnerabilities in key infrastructure and supply chains, prevent the outflow of advanced technologies to improve self-reliance. Japan, the United States, and the EU share common values. We must work together to protect and promote international order based on rules and make sure that current Russian aggression does not become an incentive or the precedent for further negative actions beyond Ukraine, for example, in the Indo-Pacific. I hope the discussion among experts in this webinar will lead to concrete cooperation among countries, sharing common values, and bring hope to the international community. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador Oe, for your <clears throat> strong words about the changed security environment. Now we have the 
final of our inter <coughs> introductory remarks in our first live action presentation <laughs> from Professor Marie Soderberg, uh, who, as I mentioned, uh, is from the European Institute of Japan Studies. Uh, what I did not mention is that Professor Soderberg is also chairperson of the Swedish Institute for International Affairs, and if I'm not mistaken, chair of the board of advisors of the European Japan Advanced Research Network. Uh, Professor Soderberg, I'd like to hand over to you uh, for the last of our opening remarks. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to give a, a, a keynote announcement for this conference. And um, although I'm the only one live, it's nice to be live also, <laughs> you know. Uh, I was very surprised listening uh, to the keynotes from the other keynote speakers. Actually, uh, our commissioner from the European Union, uh, Mr. Bret Breton, spoke very little about Europe, whereas both Ambassador Hiroshi Oe and Governor Maeda, Tadashi Maeda, spoke at length about what's happening in Ukraine. And I think that was very, very wise because that is really what is on the mind of people in Europe at this time. Does not mean that we do not care about uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific, which is the topic of this conference. Of course we do. And we have been doing that maybe sometimes too lightly in the past, but seeing how things can change very quickly and seeing what's happening in Ukraine with the Russian invasion, we need to consider that as well. We are, uh, the world is together today. And although Japan has for many years been promoting free and open in the Pacific, they have not talked that much about European security. But now in those two keynote speeches, they really did. And also both of them pointed out that we are interconnected. So both Japan and the European Union and other European states have to act together. That's my firm belief in the future. It's really very much a changing world order that we are seeing. Who could have thought that we ended up like this? I mean, already it's now a few weeks, but a month ago, no one would have imagined that we would have a, a war in, in Europe. And this can, of course, also very quickly happen in the Indo-Pacific and where we have Taiwan as one of, of the key issues where things could really happen. And I, <clears throat> I think it, it's a necessity that EU and Japan, who are like-minded, countries and share a number of common values, work together in the future. So even if we haven't shown that much uh, of our Indo-Pacific strategy from a European point of view before, we should definitely do it in the future. And we should stand up not only by the Ukraine people, but to the people all over the world, I think, and work for those values that we have together. In this connection here, I speak as an independent scholar and not necessarily as a representative of the European Institute of Japanese Studies or of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, but as an independent scholar. And I think that is also a very necessary and a point at this stage and very important for the whole of this conference that here we have gathered a number of scholars who are experts on Europe and Indo-Pacific, Japan uh, relations. And we have a responsibility not only to discuss the theoretical things of this, but actually to come up with some policy proposals, I would suggest, for how we should work in the future to be able to see to it that things like this does not happen all the time, that we do not get, we have an invasion of Ukraine. We need to solve that problem. Of course, that's at 
that's number one for the European at the moment. But we do not want something similar in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but we need to figure out how to prevent this so that it won't happen. It's very important. And it's a very sad development in the world, actually, when things like this can happen and actually do happen. Uh, EU and Japan, uh, we signed a strategic partnership agreement in 2018, which is now being implemented. This is actually a new thing that we do not only want to cooperate in economics, but also in other strategic issues. That's very important in the present world situation. Uh, we also signed a partnership on sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure. Sustainable connectivity is actually the EU keywords and quality infrastructure is what Japan is promoting, but that we should be promoting this together. It's very important as an alternative. I mean, why did we sign the strategic partnership agreement from the beginning? I think one of the things uh, that pushed it was the rise of China, but also a decline of liberalism in the world at large. And we need to counter this together. Uh, so what does this strategic partnership agreement, what kind of incentives does it give to us? Um, of course, diversified trade and travel is was one of the things. Uh, an energy platform, digital, increased access to digital service, and also a human dimension, that is people-to-people -people relations. Uh, but already before the invasion of Ukraine, uh, this strategic partnership did not move forward as quickly as expected. And one of the reasons was, of course, the COVID-19, which has prevented us from uh, traveling freely, as we used to do, between Europe and also Japan and Asia at large. Uh, but there has been a, a rather structural process of trying to find out uh, how to implement this partnership. And that must go on, not only in Western Balkans and Eastern Europe, which has been where some infrastructure, we have had the common missions together to find out what we can do together, but also in the Indo-Pacific, of course. Uh, so this need to be implemented more than has been done so far. far. And what we can say and what we've learned from COVID-19 is of course a lot of negative things, but at the same time, I think, uh, this with supply chains, for example, we already started a process with diversifying our supply chain chains, uh, where many before uh, had production in China. They now, like the Japanese has had for a long time, have China plus one or something more in the Indo-Pacific so that we are not dependent on anyone. That's one important thing. Another thing uh, is that uh, the COVID-19 actually led to huge budgets, both in EU and in Japan and other places, to be able to uh, finance what is needed. So there should be financing available for making uh, common infrastructure projects, which is an important part to uh, counter also or uh, to continue with the Belt and Road Project, the Chinese Belt and Road Project, we need to come up with alternative as well. There is also uh, a drive to get both public and private companies engaged in Indo-Pacific as well. And we need to rely on civil society and work on media if we are to be successful in implementing a strategic partnership agreement, which should be very important at the moment. Uh, mm, sustainable connectivity built on Europe and Japan, shared norms and standard settings can be used to create a better world. 
I do believe so. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, the scholars of this conference has, I, I would wish that after each session, they would kind of think through their papers and maybe come to co some conclusions where uh, they can move forward to create a better world and come up with some proposals, policy proposals that we can use in Ukraine, but also in the Indo-Pacific, of course, and uh, try to create a better world. It's actually very sad when you sit here in Sweden and you see uh, that um, we are breaking up friendship treaties with various towns in Ukraine. This is not only Ukraine. We already did that. Uh, the local communities in Sweden broke their uh, relations with local communities in China uh, and have been doing so during the last years. This is a very sad development, I think, where we are turning into a more a world which is divided again, like it used to be during the Cold War. It's not good for mankind, I believe. So there's lots of things to do. Maybe I end there. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> no, thank you, Marie. This has been a very interesting conversation. I wonder if I could tease out a couple of elements of it, um, both for my own edification and, and in order to drive the wider conversation of this conference forward. I guess but probably the first question I have, you highlighted the distinction between sustainable connectivity from the European perspective and quality infrastructure from the Japanese perspective. Um, could you give us a sense of what that division entails or are these simply two synonyms for the same underlying set of values? Mm. I think in a sense, it's uh, uh, two ways of saying the same thing, but both EU and Japan wanted their version in the agreement. That's why we have this, this double sustainable connectivity and uh, Japanese quality infrastructure. Quality infrastructure is really what Japan has been pushing uh, to counter the Belt and Road and to show that they are responsible. And I think sustainable connectivity is the same for the EU. We are pushing it forward because we think it's important and it's based, it's value based, of course. Now, in this, <coughs> in this conversation about sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure. What is the essence of the competition between what Europe and Japan could build together and what China is building on its own through the Belt and Road Initiative? Is the idea to, to set aside parallel rail transport networks or mm. ports or what? what is it exactly that we're competing through? Mm. I don't think... Um that we want to make parallel railways or anything like that. That would be really stupid. But what we are um, competing for, I guess, is to get an influence in what is happening in the world and what is happening in the developing countries. We don't want to leave it up to China to build everything for Africa, Eastern Europe, Western Balkans or Indo-Pacific. But the European wants to be part of the world development as well. And we want to show uh, both Japan and, and the Europeans that it can be done in, in a good way so that the countries are not left with big depths and uh, environmental destruction, which they did not expect. So if I if I understand you correctly, but what's embedded in this notion of of sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure is a, a, an implicit critique of the kind of infrastructure and connectivity that's being offered uh, by Belt and Road. Is there no scope to influence what China is doing and to partner with China in a triangular relationship, or, or does it have to be a bilateral approach between the EU and Japan? Mm -hmm. I think definitely uh, it should be. <laughs> It has some influence also on China, actually. The same day as the uh, this agreement was announced, uh, on the, there's a Chinese side on Belt and Road, and they actually changed the text there, uh, claiming that they are also working for a sustainable infrastructure development. So I think what we do uh, actually influences what China does as well. So it's not the one... Uh, 
outside the option. But in that sense, we are influencing the development as such. And of course, if we look at the the banking business, for example, the uh, Chinese Infrastructure Bank, many European members are members there. And why are we members in the AIIB? It's because we want to have some influence on what's happening there. So we are influencing each other and should, of course, cooperate to to uh, make a better world and sustainable connectivity and quality infrastructure. I think part of the reason that I'm asking these questions, because as I listen to, to Governor Maeda and, and Ambassador Oe, um, I'm, I'm a little bit alarmed that Russia is so isolated, not because Russia is deserving of support, in this moment, but because the isolation of Russia uh, forces it to build ever tighter relations with China to the extent to which it can, and the, the possibility that our world would be split apart into rival blocks uh, is something that I think would be interesting, would be useful, would be important for us to avoid. And so I wonder if there's scope for Europe and Japan to partner with China as a way also of preventing China from gravitating uh, into an orbit of Russia or bringing Russia into its own orbit in a way that's exclusive of a connected world economy per se. Mm. I think already in Japan, there is much more pragmatic view towards China than what we have in, in Europe. China is actually their largest trading partner, to be honest. So it's very hard to just turn away from China. and. What is really needed is to keep China on track and not get China to partnership partner with Russia in in at in the present situation, but actually live up as a responsible member to the United Nations Security Council and the rest and not support Russia. Of course, we can imagine a situation China. Uh, grabbing European companies which are now closed down in, in Russia and in making economic gains from that. But I think that's too simple. It's too simple. We need to keep an open world and we should, of course, also cooperate where it's necessary. But we also learn that things like this, like Ukraine can happen and can happen in the Indo-Pacific as well. So we do not we have to grow up from naivety <laughs> into a much more uh, diversified view and think twice before we act on a number of occasions, also in the Indo-Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Soderbergh, those were such great words to close on. I wanna thank you both for urging participants at this conference to come up with practical solutions that can be implemented and for expressing this desire for openness as we look forward uh, to the security, uh, prosperity and values of the Indo-Pacific region. It's been fabulous having you on this opening panel uh, and, and I'm afraid we're gonna have to close now, but I hope we'll see you again soon, uh, hopefully as soon as June. Thank you so much for thank joining. Thank you. <laughs> That's all we have for this panel at the moment, uh, but you'll be moving on to the next part uh, of the conference as soon as we rejoin. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining and tuning in. We are delighted uh, uh, that you uh, uh, will be you're participating uh, in this uh, uh, conference, which is recorded and will also stay on uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, this is a very timely topic, as remarked through the keynote uh, addresses, and <clears throat> we are very fortunate to have uh, top-notch experts uh, from. Uh, uh, really uh, uh, around the world. In fact, I'm not even sure whether I should greet you with a good morning because many are tuning in from Japan and others uh, might tune in uh, from uh, across the United States of America. This conference, uh, again, is organized uh, not just by the Robert Schumann Center at the European University Institute, but also uh, with uh, uh, the University of California, uh, San Diego, specifically the IGCC. And we are very thankful for uh, timing Chong for uh, providing uh, stellar uh, panelists also uh, to uh, our conference. The first panel uh, is really interested uh, in uh, not just the geopolitics of technology in the Indo Pacific, but also in the economic aspects. Uh, and we are delighted to have uh, uh, four uh, prominent uh, uh, participants. First and foremost, uh, in the order of appearance, we have uh, Dr. Dai Muchinaga who is a senior researcher at uh, Keio University's uh, uh, Research Center at SFC, uh, who focuses on cybersecurity, technology, but also on the policy aspects uh, of technology. And he has had uh, uh, 10 plus years of experience at the prestigious uh, Mitsubishi Research Institute. Next, we have Dr. Mike Okano Heimans, who is a senior research fellow at uh, the very well-known Netherlands Institute of International Relations, Klingendale, and who also lectures at Leiden University. And Maike will focus on the uh, EU digital uh, agenda in Southeast Asia with an eye also on how um, <clears throat> cooperation with Japan can actually work out there. Next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Corey Wallace, who is an assistant professor at Kanagawa University, and who has been a long time uh, specialist of uh, Japan's foreign and security policy with an eye especially on the engagement, uh, Japan's engagement uh, in Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific writ large. Uh, and uh, we are delighted to, to have Corey's uh, impressions on his latest uh, research uh, uh, avenues, specifically on uh, Japan's smart cities push uh, with an eye on security and technological development. So again, you can see that this is not just about geopolitics, but there are also industrial, political, um, and uh, economic implications as well. And last, but by no means least, we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Alice Panier, who is uh, head of the Geopolitics of Technology program at uh, very well-known IFRI, the French Institute uh, uh, for International Relations. And uh, uh, we are lucky to have uh, Alice Panier as um, a discussant uh, to uh, these uh, uh, three top-notch paper givers. And uh, 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 we are very also lucky uh, to have eventually these uh, remarks uh, uh, transform themselves into policy briefs uh, for the European University Institute. So without further ado, I'll leave the floor to uh, Dr. Mochinaga. Uh, Dai, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for my introduction and uh, everyone, good morning and good afternoon and uh, good evening. I'd like to talk about the digital Silk Road and the Chinese, China's technology influence on, in the Pacific. Uh, my presentation will explore the following questions. Uh, how does China enhance its influence on in the Pacific? And why China focuses on the region? 
and what is happening with the digital world. The digital circle is a part of the Belt and Road Initiative, and it works as the China's technology internationalization strategy. And the purpose of the strategy is leveraging technology to implementing Beijing's uh, principle in the cyber domain. The first question is how China enhances its influence on in the Pacific. The Communist Party of China illustrated a dual circulation in 2020. It is the uh, idea of uh, its economic growth with the uh, interaction between domestic and international economic circulation. The, my analysis on the uh, dual circulation can be divided in three stages. And uh, the first stage is the domestic circulation. The government supports technology development and uh, protected industries with uh, subsidies and domestic regulations. This support has made the Chinese industry competitive and, in their, and them uh, prepared for the global markets. And while the private sector developed the technologies, Beijing developed them into the social system as a policy and regulatory framework. The second stage of dual circulation is internationalizing these technologies through overseas development. BRI's projects have uh, a belt road and initiatives major projects have uh, contributed to exporting developed technologies and platforms. These projects have also enhanced the interdependency between China and BRI countries in economy and technology. Telecommunication and uh, digital payment platform and world messaging apps are good example of the China's focusing areas. And also uh, standardization is key in this internationalization. Uh, Chinese industries have standardized technologies at the international organizations with the support of Beijing. This support is critical for industries to compete with uh, other, other uh, companies uh, who, uh, which uh, set up the global technology standard for decades. The success of strategic standardization enabled China to offer infrastructure with globally standardized technology at a low cost. The third stage is getting a return and exercising influence. China derives the return associated with technologies from widespread platforms and infrastructure. For example, Chinese companies got operational contracts and a patent fee from other countries' telecom operators or manufacturers and it benefits Chinese industries and will circulate domestic investment and technology developments again. The next question is why China focus on the region? The answer is geopolitical importance and the potential of economic growth. For geopolitical importance, the digital Silk Road in, in the Pacific region provides the China, China redundant connections and the various options to expand its network access. Across, Euro, across Eurasia. Also, uh, telecommunication infrastructure connects the people and market of BRI countries with Chinese online services, such as WeChat or Alipay and other type of uh, payment platforms. These engagement correlate with economic corridors of BRI. Uh, this mark shows the uh, uh, BRI's economic corridors it has connected market in the region, which is growing at an unprecedented pace. Chinese government industries and individuals have pursued the digital economy's growth and maximized its benefits. Chinese expansion in the financial sector is uh, in the middle of the oil circulations to second stage. Uh, the Ant Group, uh, which is the uh, Chinese e-commerce company Alibaba Group's holdings affiliate, had won the uh, domestic competition and to expand its mo mobile payment system in countries in the, in the Pacific, such as Indonesia or Burma or Philippines or Singapore and so on. Uh, Chinese industries invested, those also invested in local partners with technologies and experience fostered in China. Alibaba's capabilities are spread out not only payments, but also lending. In their business, client data plays a critical role in the real lending system. Digital lenders use algorithms to identify clients' credit and provide lending. 
this credit scoring capability of Ant Financial's Zima credit associated with the data collection mechanism, which has been tested since 2015 in China. The third question and final question is what is happening with digital silk road? The more spreading Chinese technology along with digital silk road, the more dependent on them. E-commerce and online payment through, uh, through uh, broadband internet access have become a part of our everyday life. And it is difficult for people to abandon them. At the same time, it process produces a return of investment for Chinese industries. Uh, broadband internet access is necessary for connecting to customers. We have technological uh, issues. I think uh, we've lost Dai. <laughs> I suggest that uh, perhaps we uh, um, move forward, uh, since uh, it might take some time to uh, get Dai back um, with the approval from the IT services, of course. Yes, for the sake of timekeeping. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you. I'm sorry to see Daigon, but uh, we'll revert to him again uh, as he uh, turns in. In the meantime, <clears throat> I think what I would be saying uh, connects really well to what he was uh, also getting to, um, because what I would like to talk about is uh, what the EU has been doing uh, in Southeast Asia um, and the Indo-Pacific more broadly, if you will, um, discussing what's at stake um, and uh, what the EU has been doing, why the EU has been doing this, and then also look at some opportunities to uh, connect with Japan. Because I think indeed that so many countries in the region, um, in Southeast Asia, are now very much looking for alternatives uh, to, uh, from China uh, and also uh, the United States even perhaps. But of course, in this region, uh, South China, as we just saw from the various slides, Chinese platform companies, submarine cable projects, uh, China in particular is very active. Um, and while there's so much to benefit uh, for countries in the region from all that China is doing, um, this is really is filling a gap, obviously, and it's fulfilling a need. Um, there's also uh, increasing concerns, um, not just from outside players like the EU and Japan, um, but also from countries within the region itself, although there are, of course, great differences. So what I would like to do is just to sketch a bigger uh, context of that context and then also uh, highlight specific opportunities that I think in uh, the of what the EU could be doing in ASEAN. Uh, and that's focusing also on digital infra, um, also on digital regulation and on the digital economy. Um, and it's very clear that in, in recent times, uh, already in the past years, actually, the EU has been uh, enhancing its engagement with the region. Um, we saw in 2019 a cybersecurity partnership. We saw in 2020 a connectivity agreement at the ministerial level. And in 2021, of course, as we all know, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the EU made for that more general shift to the region. At the beginning of this year, uh, the EU and Singapore started negotiating what they call a digital um, uh, partnership agreement. So there's quite a bit happening already. Uh, but the focus, I think, so far has been on, uh, on the protect side, um, enhancing countries' digital resilience. Um, and I think what we need to do is also to focus on the promote side. Uh, so helping those countries to reap the opportunities uh, that come with the digital transition, because Obviously, uh, in the stages of development, they are, um, but actually also anybody is uh, also in Europe or trying to reap the benefits of the digital transition. Um, so just hoping that with you know more security, they're going to stick with a, a sort of a, a European set of standards, I think would be naive. We really have to step also on the, uh, our activities on the promote side. Um, <clears throat> so what we should be doing is ensuring that um, the, the economic competitiveness of these countries also in the digital domain uh, remains high. And of course, we know that Singapore and Indonesia, uh, they are front runners, uh, right? If you, if you look at the digital economy, 
in those uh, countries in Southeast Asia, I think they're more uh, remarkable, more burgeoning than uh, even here in Europe, you know, on the fintech field. So there's things happening uh, in Southeast Asia that we are not, un even unaware of here. And much of that is also thanks to those Chinese platform companies. Um, but we need to engage with that more. Um, and because this is the fastest growing region in terms of also of uh, the digital economy. Um, at the same time, I think what the EU can do is to help ensure that growth uh, and economic growth in the digital domain remains inclusive. That is also a clear objective of many of the countries in the region, uh, because the digital divide through the um, uh, with the uh, COVID pandemic has actually only grown. So the, the haves and the have nots in the digital domain in terms of, for example, access um, to, to broadband, to stable and fixed broadband uh, networks, um, that has actually widened. And we see that uh, big companies, they have been able to benefit very much from the COVID pandemic, but the small and medium sized enterprises, which make up most of the economy uh, also in Europe, but also in Southeast Asia, they've been really challenged to deal with that, to go through that digital transition. So they've also not been able to deal, to reap the benefits. And I think this is where those governments are now looking at to, to enhance uh, also the, the, the digital competitiveness of those companies and I think the EU can help with that. Um, this means also digital skills right, that are needed, um, not just the basic skills of how to get online and um, you know, knowing how a phone works, most people know that. But there's also um, advanced digital skills, of course, in, in how to, uh, again, strengthen the digital economy. Um, and the focus should then be on the less developed, obviously, um, the Southeast Asian countries. So I think that's a, that's a really interesting proposition that I think also we've seen from, for example, um, the research by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies uh, in, uh, in Singapore, that there's actually also uh, an interest of those countries in working with the EU. So we are not imposing our way of doing or our companies or our um, standards on the region, but this is actually responding to a real um, desire of countries in the region to, to have that alternative next to what is on offer from the Chinese and, and obviously also from countries in the region like Japan and Taiwan is actually quite active also in specific, for example, uh, health tech or uh, educational technologies. Um, so there's quite a lot happening already. And that's getting me to that final point of, you know, there's actually benefits to greater coordination and synergies between those various players in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, because there's so much to be done. That's not all, you know, go with the, the, the low hanging fruit, um, but uh, make sure that our efforts are better coordinated in order to get to better results um, for all. Um, so, as I uh, already said, the EU has been quite active. And just to you know, to summarize uh, what many of you will already know, um, the, the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy that was released uh, in September last year that had a, a digital and connectivity as two of its pillars. So, combining that sort of together as digital connectivity is, I think, uh, you know, only natural uh, that this is a key part of what the EU is doing in Southeast Asia. And this is building on what the EU has, doing, has been doing internally, which is uh, uh, you know, centered around the 2030 Digital Compass, um, which is uh, you know, a very elaborate scheme of, of ideas that uh, the EU is now implementing with the member states um, and, and in terms of enhancing government's digital skills also, right? If, if citizens actually can um, go online and manage their relations with governments also online, that will be a, a benefit to, to most um, uh, citizens, obviously. Then you also have the digital economy, how to build that, uh, you know, how to create a stronger economy. There's different elements to this compass, and I think all of those elements can be exported also to other regions. And the EU has been trying to do that, um, but I think uh, we can do more. And the Global Gateway that was launched at the end of last year is sort of the final of the three sort of um, pieces of the puzzles. Um, that make for, uh, you know, the connectivity efforts of the EU uh, globally. Um, and this, of course, was sort of, um, you know, driven by two changes of our times. And I think the first is um, the digital transition. We are now, uh, you know, going through the fourth industrial revolution where everything is, you know, connected, the physical and the digital world. And we want to make sure that the same rules that we have, uh, you know, worked so hard, I would say, um, to develop in the physical domain, you know, to maintain freedom of speech, to ensure a rules-based international order, transparency also in economic transactions, all these liberal values 
uh, they also need to be upheld in the digital domain. And that may seem very only very logical, but as we all know, uh, this is not yet where we are in practice. Uh, so the EU has been, I think, uh, one of the great pushers of the debate, for example, on taxation on big tech companies, on ensuring that we, they don't grow too big at the expense of smaller digital companies that can develop. Um, also at showing that, uh, at making sure that uh, citizens can actually own and manage their own data, right? This is the famous GDPR, the, the General <coughs> Data Protection Regulation of the EU that has inspired many throughout the world also to move in this direction. And basically all that the EU is doing is trying again to ensure that all the well the norms that we uh, uphold in the physical domain are also being upheld in the digital domain and this is not something just for europeans to want uh, although there's of course very big differences between uh, what people in europe might want compared to some countries in asia because of different levels of of development um, you know uh, some citizens and some governments may want to have you know more uh, intervention of the government in the digital domain as what we like here in europe we know that, of course, the COVID regulation and the digital tools that were used in, in parts of Asia without much, uh, you know, people, many people demonstrating against it, they did not work in Europe. So there are differences, obviously, um, between what citizens want. But I think overall, you know, all the citizens in, in both in Europe and in, in Asia want to have that freedom of speech and transparency and openness online. Um, so I think that is uh, an, an agenda where we really can work together. That's an important one, because as Dai was already saying, you know, this is being challenged um, by uh, by China's digital Silk Road. And I, I realize only now, actually, that uh, the, the Dai has returned. So I wonder, uh, Chair, if you would like me to proceed or perhaps go back to the... Uh... Yes, indeed. No, no, you, 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 you're, you're perfectly in time. And uh, uh, it's uh, nice that you mentioned Dai, uh, because uh, he uh, is back with us. We summoned Dai back and we... We would be delighted, in fact, to um, uh, to hear uh, your conclusions, um, uh, Dai. Wave of without slides, as you prefer. Okay, uh, I'm sorry for the uh, late. Sorry for the my computer was rebooted. So I would like to conclude. Uh, I would like to continue my slide. Okay. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay, okay, I'm sharing the my. How about this? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I think I, I'm short to, uh, I think quickly uh, go through the my slide and the, uh, I introduced the, uh, the Chinese digital silk road, but there is uh, so many challenges in digital silk road because they, uh, they have all still dependent on the Western technology and platforms, such as the uh, semiconductors operating system and the transaction databases. And also there is uh, some countries opted not to adopt the Chinese technologies. For example, Vietnamese telecommunication operators does not accept the using, does not plan to using the Huawei's uh, using the Huawei's equipment and some Singapore telecom operators using the uh, Nokia and the Ericsson's for the 5G, 5G infrastructure. And uh, lastly, uh, there is an incomplete this dual circulation. For example, the Global in Initiative on Data Security, which is a China's uh, policy to implement the implement the global orders uh, to in, to secure their idea. Which is which shows the incompleteness of the dual circulation, and um, I like to briefly touch on the uh, Japan's reaction to the digital silk road. Uh, now Japan is uh, going to the uh, integrate ongoing initiatives uh, under the Free Open in the Pacific, which uh, contains the cyber uh, ongoing existing cyber diplomacy and partnership of the quality infrastructure and the data free flow with trust, which is a Japanese uh, uh, initi initiative on regarding the data security. And lastly, Japan is collaborating with allies to offer uh, regional partners uh, to op alternative, alternative options to the, uh, to the Chinese BRI. Here's my uh, presentation conclusion. Uh, this is a Silk Road promotes technology internationalization 
and uh, China leveraging technologies to getting a return on investment on the implementing Beijing principle in the subdomain. And the Chinese, China's technology influence spreads to the in the Pacific region, but it's not enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dai. And without further ado, we jump into um, Corey Wallace's, uh, uh, Dr. Wallace's presentation, which as you will see fits nicely with this panel's composition, which has focused respectively on China, the EU, and now, and now on Japan's, uh, and on, on Japan's uh, technological uh, and digital uh, embrace, uh, also Southeast Asia from a security, but also an economic standpoint. The floor is yours, Corey. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Sorry. Okay. So thank you for the opportunity to present on the topic of smart cities and Japan's economic security agenda. Uh, as a warning, this is still at very much at the exploratory and speculative stage, simply because Japan's own parliament has only just this last week started debate on its economic security legislation. But nevertheless, uh, I want to share some thoughts about the uh, broader project and also hopefully hear some ideas from our experts, both on this panel and perhaps uh, watching from home, so to speak. So. Um, So a lot, first of all, what are smart cities? So in the interest of time, let's go through really quickly. There are a bundle of technological and institutional arrangements and networks for integrate, integrating and transforming data, basically. Um, this data is used to inform and direct actions by agents to solve various ecological, economic, and social problems. Actions can be taken in real time by individuals, institutions, and even autonomous uh, technology actors to keep a city humming or moving in real time. Or uh, stakeholders can use this data to enhance their ability to do predictive modeling so they can think about introducing new services, use infrastructure in innovative and uh, new ways. And from a te technological point of view, they're comprised of energy and digital infrastructure backbone connected to what we call uh, edge devices and applications. So um, I'll show an example there on the next slide. But one thing that I do want to point out that's probably quite important in the case of Japan is that they are also platforms for driving technological innovation itself, not just for solving certain problems. So, you know, one very broad way of thinking about them really is just a network of networks um, that provide a lot of services and functions um, that enhance some of the benefits that we have already enjoyed through history um, in the uh, development of cities, as well as some of address some of their uh, downsides. So anyway, this is a very, very uh, functory definition there. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these technologies one by one, uh, especially with the short amount of time. Um, let's just focus on a couple. So I think everyone uh, sort of knows the smart grid, uh, smart city as smart grid conception. Here, there's a you have a number of different energy sources connecting. Uh, with smart devices, smart meters, different types of storage uh, uh, platforms to basically drive uh, carbon efficiencies, reduce emissions. And if it goes, uh, if the energy source is renewable, then essentially emula uh, eliminate uh, carbon um, emissions, which the cities are, of course, the biggest uh, contributor to. Uh, and so in the Japan case, uh, we've seen a number of, this is this particular aspect has been developed. There's been a number of test beds, including in my own city, Yokohama. And uh, we've also seen TEPCO, the, uh, the Tokyo area's big uh, regional monop power monopoly, have also 
uh, a year ahead of uh, plan actually implemented 29 million smart meters uh, throughout this region. So uh, this is one thing that's gotten a lot of uh, interest from well over a decade um, previously in Japan. Uh, other potential applications relate to the use of sensors being put around cities, and that can obviously do many, many things. One interesting one is uh, to help build uh, flood models or how cities will be impacted by natural disasters. And they can, this can help uh, city planners identify uh, risk maps, identify ideal um, evacuation routes, uh, and essentially uh, attempt to make the city more resilient where it can identify uh, bottlenecks and uh, uh, risky areas. And I think probably for me, one well, of the most fascinating part is the what we call uh, digital twins. So this is basically the idea of uh, combining sensors and data on buildings and geographical space together, essentially to create a virtual city sitting side by side with the physical city. And uh, one of the, and this can, this will help with many things, but one of the anticipated future applications could be what we call um, autonomous air mobility, which is essentially using 3D space for transporting goods, um, like for example, during a natural disaster or even just in the normal course of business. But also, uh, if we're getting very adventurous, perhaps even um, people. So this is a very perfunctory sort of introduction. As you can see from this mess of uh, uh, potentially imagined applications, and this is not even exhaustive, there's a lot of uh, optimism, maybe hype, about smart cities going forward. So. For me, what is interesting is why, why should Tokyo, why should the Japanese government care about smart cities? And so um, I've identified about five good reasons I think they should care, um, aside from the fact that most people would love to live in a cool, futuristic and convenient city. Putting aside that, I think there are five important imperatives. Okay, so the first one is the moral imperative. Japan's own self-positioning in the international community here um, as a constructive international actor and as one that wants to provide high quality, high tech solutions as to emerging countries development. And Japan itself tells a, a, a compelling story about its own post-war um, recovery and development through adaptation of technology and various types of um, socioeconomic um innovations and so if you have the capability and therefore responsibility to meet global challenges especially the ones that we see right now then of course japan uh, should but there is i think a feeling that you need to go beyond branding exercises like this uh, sustainable development goals and i myself uh, being at a japanese university are guilty of this and i think we need to do more than just plaster sdgs all around the subways and everything we need to uh, uh, invest a lot more in uh, realizing the SDGs. And this, I think the smart city platform is a really great one to do this. Um, and so, you know, ba basically Japan can fulfill its diplomatic identity through the promotion of a smart city platform. There are the demographic challenges. Uh, I think, most people are pretty aware of Japan as the uh, most aged society uh, in the world. So I don't think I'll dwell on this one very much. But really briefly, Japan needs to do two things. First, it needs to reverse the vicious cycle of depopulation in its regions and regional cities. But also some of the mega cities uh, above all Tokyo are actually still growing. And uh, they, they also introduce certain types of uh, pressures and challenges that um, uh, smart city platforms promise to to help, um, ranging from the environmental to the uh, labor, maintaining social service provision, and Japan itself becoming perhaps a model for other uh, emerging Asian nations, some of them who are at risk of getting uh, old, so to speak, before they get rich as such. So 
Um, I think this, again, the smart city platform here has some importance. Uh, there's the Indo-Pacific strategy and uh, Dai sort of went into the China side of this. So I guess this is just a, the, essentially the uh, reverse. Um, cooperation with Indo-Pacific partners as a provider of global goods, enhances Japan's diplomatic strategic contrast with China, um, enhances its the horizontal connectivity of the region, which uh, in a previous paper I sort of talked about as being helping other countries not become cooperate with each other so they are actually less dependent vertically so to speak on the uh, uh, great powers um, and one of them of course is China but there are other of course uh, looming geopolitical actors out there as well and so you know there are already some good examples of this uh, the ASEAN Japan connectivity initiative the smart city forum and of course the partnership for quality infrastructure feeds into this as well um, and so this is essentially the sort of vision that uh, the Indo-Pacific vision um, that you can sort of see that there is a envisioned connectivity all the way from the Mekong through to India to East Africa with uh, maritime economic corridors as well. So this connect into this is the uh, economic opportunities, economic revitalization elements. Um, again, enabling Japan, uh, the in external demand will help complement the internal demand in Japan uh, that we will have for smart city solutions as the population ages. So that cannot be a bad thing. Uh, a number of Japanese companies envision uh, uh, a lot of these smart city technologies enabling its own supply chain. But I think a really important thing is there's a huge global problem with the proof of concept stage for smart cities. Um, it's not the technology, it's often the uh, institutional or the, uh, the non-technological factors are an issue. Um, and a lot of these don't go beyond the test bed and are not scaled up to the uh, city levels uh, uh, scale or very, remain very narrow. So essentially we need as many living laboratories as possible globally for the smart city concepts beyond just being applications of technology to take hold. And uh, finally, I think there are a number of national security uh, elements for that Japan should probably consider. Um, energy security, I think most people know Japan has issues with its own energy security, always has, and uh, even more continues to do so. Um, but I think we've also been given a very valuable lesson recently with events in Europe about how important that technolo technology, economic power and diplomatic influence uh, remain. And uh, the ability to impose economic and technological costs on a, another nation are obviously very important. Um, another one is to address the mega trends in the emerging world. So the flip side of Japan and some other Northeast Asian nations demographic challenges are the challenges that we may see further afield, which we see rapid population growth, rapid urbanization, young societies, higher levels of education, heightening aspirations. Um, in some sense, if you look at it in one way, it could be a major demographic dividend for everybody involved. But of course, we all know of the uh, social challenges, we all know of the environmental challenges um, that we see in the emerging world and the pandemic has revealed this very starkly as well. Um, and so it's worthwhile asking whether we'll see a demographic dividend or demographic disaster or something in between perhaps um, arising. So again, I think the, the smart tech city platform uh, is very useful in terms of uh, enhancing Japan's national security. We, the, the, <clears throat> sorry, the development of these cities in the emerging world is ex extremely intimately tight, tightly connected to um, human security outcomes, which over time could well uh, put pressure on the Japanese government for uh, 
even dispatch of its own military, um, which is an issue considering Japan is actually much more focused recently on its own neighborhood where there are plenty of security challenges. And I'll just skip through this part uh, very quickly. Um, there are also military security aspects simply because almost every single one of these smart city technologies, even though it sounds like a very nice platform for you know convenient, environmentally sensitive living, they all have extremely important military applications or military significance. And if, um, if you know about Japan's defense budget, um, it's not particularly high relative to the challenges it has. Its defense R&D investments are actually pretty low and its defense industry is uh, a little bit uh, sort of underdeveloped, well, not underdeveloped in terms of the quality of the products they produce, but it's very narrow, it's narrowing in terms of the companies involved. So um, here you can see the uh, percentage of Japanese um, defense R&D as a percentage of its general R&D expenditure. Um, Japan is much closer to Finland than it is a number of other comparative OECD nations. So I guess I, I sent, putting it very simply, uh, taking up the slack, uh, the civilian sector is obviously going to take up the slack for Japan. Okay, so um, just to sort of finish off, uh, this is the exploratory part in particular, is I still have a number of questions. So this all sounds very nice and well, but um, Japan does have a number of government agents working, working on the uh, smart city uh, uh, agenda, and they all put out their own documents, and they're all very interesting and detailed. But I have a question whether the silos in Japan's government can be broken down. Are they working with each other in coordination with each other, or are they working across each other? And if you're thinking about something like smart cities, the key word has been connectivity and working across boundaries. Well, can Japan's government agencies do that? Um, has the government appreciated the importance of the community in these uh, projects, what is usually called the quadruple helix? So yes, we've got business and government. Sometimes we, uh, they include academia, but what about the people? This can be very important. Uh, for example, last year, a subsidiary of Google had to walk away from a uh, smart city project in Toronto, main, mainly because it had alienated um, the local people due to a lack of prior consultation about how to use their data. So that's something else. And then lastly, uh, will this be affected by the Kashida administration's economic security agenda? Um, you know, if you're know, uh, aware of the agenda, basically it's four things, supply chain security, uh, controlling who has access to make changes to Japan's infrastructure services, support programs for development advanced tech and non-disclosure for patent applications. Um, it's sort of been a very, uh, Professor Suzuki from uh, Tokyo University has labeled this a very defensive agenda. And it's not really sort of talked much about the overseas smart city cooperation agenda. And you don't have to search very far to find situations where Japan is, Japanese companies are cooperating very closely with Chinese companies, both on smart city projects in China, but also in so-called third countries. And this is not in itself necessarily a bad thing, but if the smart, uh, the economic security agenda really does emphasize self-reliance, then we have to think about um, what that might actually mean for Japan's overseas cooperation on these projects um, as a sort of note there. And in fact, we've seen a lot of pushback from Japan's business community precisely for the reasons that it could jeopardize um, Japan's partnerships overseas. So I think a lot of this will have to do with how, um, how literally and how strictly the Japanese government uh, implements any of the potential restrictions or uh, regulations it does end up legislating for itself. So, um, 
the main question I want to sort of explore going forward, and I would be really happy to hear any uh, people's feedback on this, is um, you know, do the costs outweigh the benefits of a overly protective or um, self-reliant approach? Um, and could if this new legislation uh, implemented strictly actually hurt Japan's economic and military security more than it harms it, especially within the context of the um, smart city agenda. So anyway, I'll just leave it uh, right there. Um, and uh, I'll be very interested to hear any feedback um, as I approach, keep going on this project into the future. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Corey. Um, <clears throat> I have to apologize because uh, I uh, uh, thought that uh, Micah was passing the baton earlier on, uh, while in fact she still had to uh, um, flesh out her conclusions. So what we will do is that we um, would, uh, with Micah's uh, approval, we would go and we would want to move uh, to Alice's uh, um, discussion uh, of uh, these uh, free presentations. I encourage all of the viewers to type in their questions and comments in the chat function of the YouTube channel. Um, and with uh, a profuse apologies for the technical uh, issues uh, and uh, the miscommunication, I look forward also to hear uh, more from Mike uh, during uh, uh, the uh, discussion and Q&A session. Um, so without further ado, Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you, Giulio. Um, can you hear me all right? Great. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to read uh, the panelists' uh, papers and presentations ahead of time. So my comments will be based uh, on, uh, on what I read uh, as well as uh, what I heard ju just now. Uh, I'm going to make a few general comments before moving uh, in the order of the panel into uh, each, uh, each panelist's um, paper and presentation. I think as a general uh, matter, what we see, what I find interesting in this uh, in this uh, set of presentations is how um, digital transformation, connectivity and smart cities do cross uh, business regulation and national security concerns. So we are really, that's what Corey was concluding on as well, uh, looking at uh, sort of cross-governmental approaches to, to smart cities in Japan. So crossing business regulation and, and national security, as well as um, raising questions for where to place the boundary between national self-reliance and international cooperation or integration. What we see as well on this uh, international cooperation part maybe is that there is a degree of first mover advantage in connectivity initiatives and it seems to me that um, reading through uh, the presentation the, the papers and presentations that once a, a country has established some degree of uh, infrastructure partnership then uh, this kind of settles it in a way and that's why we're facing now this uh, uh, this launch of competing initiatives from china eu or us i'll, I'll come back to that in a moment um, so actually, there are some cross-cutting uh, themes and arguments uh, in, in each presentation, uh, which can each be discussed uh, individually. But one aspect is that China seems to be more of a rational and strategic uh, actor that has a number of core interests, both business and national security, that are well-defined, well-identified, and that China manages to launch influent uh, uh, policies to pursue those business and national security interests and is proactive in doing so. The EU, by contrast, appears as uh, soft and more regulation-oriented, which is no surprise, uh, and not so much focused on strategic or even business interests, but more value-based and also perhaps more reactive, which linking to what I just said before about first mover advantage, perhaps is a bit of a worrying trend. The US is notoriously, uh, is notably, sorry, uh, absent from uh, each picture. I think Mike uh, mentioned the US at some point, but in the papers and presentations, the US initiatives in the regions are in the region are absent, which uh, uh, leads me to, to wonder and ask, you know, is it possible to talk about Europe in the Indo-Pacific on digital without talking about the US and what it is trying to do there? Another point I think is ASEAN and Indo-Pacific countries, whether they're looked at as actors or as recipients of uh, foreign powers policies, including EU policy, China policy, 
uh, and, and, and the US's policy, and to what extent we provide agency to either Indo-Pacific countries or Asian countries more specifically in those uh, international policies. Uh, also interesting I find is, the, uh, is taking into account the diversity of the political regimes and the degree of digital advancement in the region and how that may affect you know, uh, regional approach or whole of a region approach. One question as well that I think I want to raise for all of the presenters is the role of the private sector in the digitalization trend. Uh, and because it seems to be, um, it seems to me that the presentations were all more uh, state focused in terms of the initiatives. So more specifically, a few points on Dai's presentation. Uh, I found uh, interesting the balanced assessment of China's influence uh, I noticed that China indeed appears as very strategic and rational and well organized in pursuing its goals. But uh, it was interesting that you raised some of the limitations, including uh, refusal of the uh, data security approach and ho or, for example, Vietnam's rejection of Huawei uh, as a as a telecom infrastructure uh, equipment um, provider, and also the fact that China depends on Western technology. I found also interesting that in the end, uh, a lot of the success in China's projects is about uh, the financial incentives and. Uh, you know, with all what, what I've just said about China being strategic and rational, in the end, it's also just a matter uh, down the line of, of money uh, that is being put on the table. And also an interesting point on the internal external linkage uh, uh, of China's technology policy, which provides it with a degree of coherence that maybe other countries, and I'm thinking here maybe of the EU, don't have that same degree of consistency. Um, so um, in the end, uh, China has uh, very concrete modalities of influence, which you explain financial, technical standards, maintenance, uh, and also China is investing in major infrastructure, but also smaller uh, digital uh, tools like mobile apps, uh, social networks and e-payment apps, for example, that uh, citizens, individual citizens will use. Um, and what I find interesting, I'll go back to that in a moment, but it's China's offers in the end response to certain states that are more authoritarian in terms of their political regime. In those states bid for social control and political stability, and you mentioned Cambodia, Myanmar, and Laos as being uh, primary customers, if you like, of Chinese technologies because of their authoritarian um, qualities as well. Perhaps I think you could uh, you could dig further into the limits and inefficiencies of the BRI and uh, digital Silk Road uh, because you mentioned that in passing. But again, maybe uh, having a more nuanced view of uh, of China's bulldozer and maybe where it uh, where its limits are because that's also where maybe our opportunities uh, stand. Um, and uh, also a more political question is that links to a point I just made, which is to what extent the digital Silk Road in the end will turn countries towards China that didn't previously have those political or economic uh, or business ties? Or to what extent uh, in the end, uh, is it just a natural sphere of influence among, non among less, less democratic countries, if you see what I mean? To what extent is Chinese offer turning people towards China or countries towards China? And to what extent is it, uh, is it a more natural, if you like, uh, evolution or a set of ties? Also, maybe a question for the EU or Japan and other like-minded countries is then if our approach or those countries' approach to uh, is not appealing to those autocratic governments, if the, the norms and regulations or even the financial incentives are not appealing, then what about civil society engagement, building knowledge not only about digital literacy, and i.e. how to use uh, the digital tools, but also maybe literacy about uh, um, social control through technology. And also here it would, would be interesting to hear about the US counter strategies to, to, the, uh, to China's digital Silk Road. Moving to Micah's presentation, um, I very much liked uh, your point about how better coordination in digital foreign policy uh, with the EU's partners and among those various countries um, can be can be useful. Um, I also liked some points you made about Asian countries, uh, how Europeans can learn from uh, certain uh, uh, successes in Asian countries, for example, fintech, which you mentioned. Uh, where uh, mobile banking or e-payment systems could could serve as a as a set of best practices for for Europeans to learn about. 
Um, I do. Uh, I, I would be curious, maybe in your paper, to, to learn more about what are the existing links that all the new initiatives are building on, uh, and maybe what is to start with. What is the volume and type of digital exchanges that already exist uh, between the EU and ASEAN countries, so that we better understand, you know, what more is to be built. Uh, and in this particular case, what the global gateway, uh, which you explained a little bit more uh, in your overall presentation, but lesser in your less so in your paper, you know, what the global gateway is actually about, what what will add to what is already there? Is it exporting exporting norms? Is it business to business links? Is it more funding? Uh, so maybe if we have already more details, it would be interesting to to have more of that. A uh, question of agency, I was mentioning what uh, Europe can learn from Asian countries in certain aspects. Um, but also in your paper, sometimes there is this duality between uh, ASEAN as a, as a playground for EU's or Japan's policies uh, related to connectivity as those countries being somehow targets for our foreign policies, even if it's cooperative policies, or whether they are co-policy makers uh, for, for the EU uh, and Japan. Also in your paper, you mentioned the importance of Japan, obviously, but also India as a partner uh, for the EU in its Asian uh, policy. I was wondering what about uh, the Republic of Korea, which is also um, obviously a regional uh, partner for the EU. Um, and in the end, my question to you would be more generally, uh, why EU plus Japan vis-a-vis -vis ASEAN um, is is it is this type of dual coordination uh, better than a more multilateral or whole of region uh, approach? That would be my first question. And a second question would be thinking about the business opportunities and the business dimension to the extent that the EU and Japan can be economic competitors in certain uh, domains of the digital uh, sector. How does that uh, fit with the cooperative approach? Finally, um, Corey's uh, presentation, uh, uh, I liked a few points, especially the fact that in the end you show that smart cities uh, and the goals around smart cities go well beyond the smart city itself. It's a matter of positioning for countries, it's a matter of image, of uh, power, including soft power, attractiveness as well from a business as well as uh, probably global um, uh, uh, talents uh, perspective and a matter of economic revenue. Also, something you raised was that uh, smart cities also sit within diplomatic initiatives at the international level. Uh, so they are not only local pieces, they can also be um, uh, you know, part of connectivity initiatives and, and other diplomatic initiatives. And also a point you made about dual technologies being deployed as part of smart cities space drones uh, and sensors uh, being cases in point. Something you raised, to, you raised towards the end of your presentation is uh, that uh, there are a lot of um, supply chain concerns maybe and you know with regards to components and uh, raw materials that will be you know involved in all those um, edge, uh, uh, edge computing or connected objects that will you know, be spread around the smart cities and to what extent will this increase foreign dependencies and to what extent is it being considered and take, taken into account when we are facing yet another set of uh, you know, lack of components, especially in Europe now we have uh, again car manufacturing, uh, com uh, car manufacturing factories that are uh, being put on hold for lack of semiconductors. Uh, and also related to who are the actors, uh, you mentioned all these government, I think, initiatives, government-led initiatives. And to what extent is it a private sector-led thing? Because again, we imagine just it's a whole new market opening for all those companies that will want to enter that market of smart cities. Um, so just wondering if you could uh, develop a little bit on that. Uh, and then telling us who are the providers of the Japanese smart technology, uh, smart city technology. Uh, I'll stop here because I've already been uh, a bit long, but there is so much to, to say. I um, uh, look forward to hearing again the comments. If you like, uh, the panelists, I can send you my comments in writing as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very, very much, Alice, for those uh, very insightful and incisive uh, uh, comments and questions. 
for the sake of timekeeping, I would add uh, um, a couple of questions that we have received from a YouTube channel. Um, <clears throat> and uh, specifically uh, for uh, uh, Maike and Dai, um, um, could you address uh, this question um, um, that, uh, from an anonymous uh, viewer specific to the difference between uh, US, EU and Japan regulatory philosophies of data flow? Um, and if you could focus especially on uh, the Japanese side of the story, Dai, and the European side of the story, especially uh, the EU insistence on uh, GDPR um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the exporting of GDPR um, through uh, adequacy decisions uh, in uh, third countries. And for Corey, um, I would like to ask you to add to um, uh, Alice's uh, um, points. Uh, um, Marco Zappa from the University of Venice uh, is curious about the Japanese government's uh, narrative uh, over uh, uh, smart city, which seems to be more focused on connectivity and sustainability rather than urban governance, um, specifically crime prevention and surveillance. So Marco asks, uh, where do Japanese governmental agencies and companies actually position themselves in these, uh, in these areas? Now, <clears throat> I would ask uh, Maike to start uh, the uh, uh, um, response panel, so to speak, because uh, I uh, unfortunately cut her short through our uh, <laughs> jam session of a panel. I'm very sorry that we experienced IT trouble. Um, and that I misunderstood uh, uh, Mike's uh, remarks earlier on. So if you want to conclude with your presentation and also touch upon what others have said and Alice's um, uh, uh, remarks, uh, it would be very helpful. Thank you very much. And thanks so much, uh, yeah, thanks so much, Julio. And of course, no technical issues happen. I think, you know, one of the positives of the digital domain is that we actually can gather uh, more easily and more people online. But then, you know, you have a, some technical issues deal with that. In the meantime, that's not a problem. Um, <clears throat> and I'll weave in, you know, the, the, the final part of my presentation that I uh, was had planned uh, in, in my answers, because I think, you know, some of the questions that were raised also uh, can easily be addressed. Um, in such a way. I guess what I had wanted to do also earlier is to, to highlight a few areas uh, of where I think there's opportunities for the EU to act in ASEAN, with ASEAN, um, and also to connect uh, with Japan. Because again, I think uh, better coordination, uh, better more synergies will be beneficial to, to the region, specifically to the countries that uh, we are talking about. Um, and that was digital infrastructure, uh, the data governance, um, and uh, the digital economy. Those are the three areas that I think uh, require our attention. And as we all know, on data regulation, the EU has actually done a lot already. So that's a segue into the question that you just raised of, um, yes, indeed, there's different camps, I think, on, on how to regulate data. Um, the EU is very much a proponent of, of giving ownership to citizens, to users, to manage and own their own data. Uh, and the EU has gone, you know, quite extreme in that sense, even at the expense of innovation at times. Because uh, as, as I think uh, was, was explained earlier, you know, the more you can gather in for data, uh, as Corey was explaining, the more that will also help digital uh, innovation and again, commercialization of that digital innovation. So by sort of, you know, yeah, hampering that collection of data, the EU has also uh, hampered innovation and, and collection of innovation and valorization of innovation. And that's that's a challenge that the EU is now uh, understanding more, than, I think, than what we understood it, uh, the way we understood it earlier on when the GDPR was implemented. Um, so I think the EU is now sort of trying to find different ways to help actually also, um, you know, more valorization of innovation by companies, um, by fostering greater cooperation between companies, um, by making sure that they also are able to collect and, and, and use data, um, you know, within the remits of the GDPR. And I think what stands out here is the difference, and I, I'm, I'm very curious about Dai's response actually, because I think indeed Japan is standing sort of in between. It has an adequacy agreement on data uh, sharing, you know, with the European Union for for private data, um, but at the same time, it's very much engaging with APAC, and uh, the the APAC is, as, as, as you know, some people might know, has a very different approach to managing data. It's basically asking. 
uh, of companies to voluntarily comply to uh, you know certain regulations rather than uh, you know imposing that from the top. So that's two very different approaches, and Japan seems to be engaging with both sides. But ultimately, I think what we want is um, you know is uh, shared data between you know bigger groups of countries and not have sort of the noodle bowl that we had seen in trade agreements earlier also in data sharing so what japan is actually you know wanting in the southeast asian region is not entirely clear to me um i've also uh, heard from you know talking to people in the region business representatives that you know japan's free data flow is of course dfft uh, data flow with trust is a big initiative um that everybody knows about but you know, in terms of implementation in Southeast Asia, there has been lagging. Um, so, yeah, again, curious to hear what Dai has to say about that, because that will also, you know, have great implications of to what extent can we synergize in this important domain? Uh, because the standards that we set here, I think, will be very important, um, you know, for the future and for companies to ensure also that, you know, we have interoperability between the regions. Um, on the question, Alice, you know, you, you, you posed many interesting questions and, and the importance of the private sector uh, and the way the need to engage them and, and for Europe to do that much more now and that we have done so far is, is I think, acknowledged in Global Gateway. Um, there had been in the making a business advisory group, um, you know, in, in Europe's connectivity strategy 1.0. Um, before Global Gateway came into making, we had already uh, much of that, um, but that, that is still being discussed. So how to do this? This is actually also something where, you know, perhaps we can even learn from Japan, where they have had Shingikai for, you know, way longer and, and you know, means to engage private sector with experts and government officials. Um, I think that's something that we in Europe can learn from um and what we should do more and i know that you know big companies like nokia and ericsson they've also been calling for ways of, you know by which the, the huge funding that is required for you know what they are doing can also be you know facilitated with uh, with uh, european funds and i think also the eu is now looking into this um so there is you know a lot happening but yeah we don't yet see much of it i think happening on the ground what we do see happening and, and where, you know, I would like to link with your question about the United States um, is um, the, the, you know, of helping countries to create the better, you know, knowledge and tools, the statistics on, on what is happening in the digital domain. You know, how many, uh, you know, what's the level of, of broadband, fixed broadband penetration versus mobile uh, broad, uh, penetration? Uh, what is the use of the internet by specific groups of people? All these data are very important as we create better policies that, you know, again, enhance economic competitiveness and address the digital divide. And the EU for several years already has been very active with this so-called ASEAN Digital Index. Um, and it is now going to work with um, national statistics agencies in Southeast Asian countries. That's, a, I think, a wonderful project that very few people are aware of. Um, and then surprisingly, what people are aware of is a relatively new sort of, you know, project that uh, I think was launched just a few months ago by the United States, you know, of a similar type. Um, so I think that shows also how the EU sometimes, you know, fails to connect in ways that resonate with ASEAN countries individually. So we work more at the ASEAN level because we like the block to block approach, but we need to do more also, you know, at the member state level. I think that's one issue. Uh, and obviously, we're also dealing with the fact that many countries in the region, you know, they, they are so tied for their security to uh, the United States that, you know, many times they will just be looking uh, at the United States uh, more than they would be looking at the EU. So when we do have these beautiful projects, I think the EU should all the, pay all the more efforts to ensure that it actually reaches the people. Um, and that we also connect with what the United States is doing, um, because otherwise we risk, you know, doing the same thing, like with this uh, statistics, um, you know, yeah, as a policy tool uh, for development. That's uh, that's really, uh, I think, a, a waste of, of, of effort. And I'm still trying to understand to what extent, you know, many people in the, in the Southeast Asian countries themselves were aware, actually, that both were going on at the same time. And I think there's actually some multilateral organizations even that are doing similar things. So it would also be, I think, in their best interest because, you know, they also, have, you know, cannot deal with, you know, all these offerings at the same time. For them also, it would be better to have one uh, bigger, you know, project that delivers really well. 
I'll leave it to that. We will also allow time for others to respond. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we'll uh, then move to Dai and then Corey. Hey. Dai? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Alice, and the, uh, it's a great uh, comment. Uh, okay, I'd like to catch up the your comment following the uh, regarding the Chinese uh, posture regarding the digital areas. Uh, there, I think the uh, the Chinese policy looks like a very uh, coordinated, but it, I think I believe this image was. Uh, built by the uh, later action by uh, taken by the Chinese government. It means the uh, there are so many failure in China because they and they are picking up the only successful uh, projects and made up with the uh, digital Silk Road or some kind of uh, strategies and uh, looks like their policy or strategy is attractive for the authoritarian states, such as the. Uh, these authoritarian states with has a priority in economic growth and uh, security and their, their stable political regime. All these aspects is supported by the telecommunication or the other type of ICTs. So I think the uh, China is looking at in these area as a global leader of making a regulation, just like EU. Because the, uh, uh, this is the uh, connect to the uh, the Japanese uh, position regarding the data flow, but I focusing on the Chinese uh, position. How uh, is uh, your question about to what extent uh, the South Road is going to goes to? Is the uh, they uh, China aims to be a uh, next uh, leader of the of making the regulation, just like making a GDPR like GDPR and. The, Making the other state, other states uh, follow these policies and regulation is spread all, all over the world. Is a result of the GDPR. It's a, it's a result of the GDPR. And Japan is also following the uh, the same way to same way of the uh, GDPR regulations. Uh, one thing, one of the pro proof is the adequacy decision by EU. Um, the the Japan is the first country in East Asia uh, of the uh, uh, get the adequacy decision, and the next one is the South Korea. So the, the, that that kind of situation is very historical movement for Japan. And Japan is following that kind of data protection policy, uh, starting from the 1980s OECD guideline regarding the privacy, and then the 19, uh, 1995's the data protection directive, and then follow Japan uh, established the, their uh, personal data protection data protection law in 2003. So that kind of movement shows the uh, Japan is aligned with uh, aligned with the European policy uh, in data protection, but also they also uh, looking at the U.S. 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 company or U.S. government initiative, like uh, just like the building the internet system or the uh, other type of technology development. That ecosystem in the United States is a ideal model for Japan. So that kind of, that kind of situation is a very, very, uh, very interesting situation for Japan. One side is they would like to protect data, uh, personal data aligned with Europe. Europe. And also, they would like to align with the United States in technological technology development. This situation uh, is a very uh, interesting push, positioning of Japan. And also, I uh, like to say that Japan's stance of regarding this is a uh, this is a question. My answer for the question regarding the philosophies of data flow. They would like to protect their personal data in aligned with EU GDPR. And also they would like to uh, go expand these uh, philosophy to the other country, including the United States. Uh, Japan is highly valued the personal data and hopefully accept the United States or the other ASEAN countries uh, Japan is now hoping. that. But known personal data 
if the regarding the non-personal data, that, that could, should be uh, freely used used by the company or the or the economic growth. That is a Japanese uh, thinking in data flow. Thank you. Thank you, Dai. And if you're interested in data, do not miss uh, uh, tomorrow's uh, uh, panel, <clears throat> the fourth panel of this conference, uh, which will uh, take place at 12 uh, uh, C uh, uh, Florence time, CET, because it will revolve on 5G and especially data and data regulation, the geopolitics with guests from uh, uh, and speakers from Japan, the, uh, Europe, and also Singapore, who will talk about the EPA. The EPA. Um, we now move to um, uh, Corey. Uh, the floor is yours, Corey. Great, thank you very much. So, two really great questions. Um, and I have, again, some, some funky thoughts. And uh, I will start with Alice's question. So. In terms of the importance of the private sector, and I can definitely see from my presentation how uh, that didn't, uh, wasn't very prominent, but uh, Alice is absolutely correct. It is a very, very important part of the Japanese uh, smart, city, smart city ecosystem. And, you know, I mean, the Japanese government, or at least the economic uh, agencies, don't usually act uh, sort of independently without uh, seeing some kind of reason to act. And you can even see this with like the Indo-Pacific strategy. Yes, Abe, both his first time and second time, he was extremely important in the political leadership, but Japanese uh, companies were already pursuing a lot of trade opportunities, investment opportunities, uh, setting up production networks, supply chains um, for four years and years beforehand. And then the Japanese government comes in and sort of identifies some geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, important geopolitical economic issues and uh, things that Japan has to have some influence on. Well, this is exactly the same for the smart city um, uh, sort of project and outreach. Japan's been involved uh, both through domestic test beds and domestic experiments, but also a number of its companies have been uh, active overseas as well. So if you want to sort of uh, know who the providers are, well, at the sort of top, you've got the Japan's sort of quite special integrated trading companies, I guess is the translation for it is they basically do almost everything um, and everything uh, to do with overseas trade. Um, they have connections to technology. They have access to technology, to financing through banks, through, um, you know, all, all sorts of things there. The uh, spread, the broadness of their uh, operations are quite impressive sometimes. Um, so those are companies like Marubeni and Sojits and so forth, Mitsubishi banks. But this has also attracted a lot of uh, uh, attention from uh, traditional tra uh, traditional technology companies. So, for example, close to me is a, a city outside of Yokohama called Fujisawa, and they had the old Panasonic factory there that used to make all sorts of things for years and years. When they closed that down, they decided to turn the real estate there into a... Uh, uh, probably one of the more successful examples of a uh, smart city test bed. And that was mostly without government um, influence for that period of time. Um, and then uh, I showed the image, the very nice image with Fuji. Um, and my sh shot was of Toyota City, or uh, I think not actually Toyota City, literally, I think a place right next to it, which is basically Toyota's uh, sort of uh, appeal to the world about like, this is how a wonderful smart city can can look. It's high tech. And also, by the way, Mount Fuji's right there. So, um, you know, yeah, the Japanese uh, sec uh, private sector is absolutely uh, on, on board with this. And I think that's probably why they're actually pushing back against the economic security agenda, which is actually one of the rare examples of the Japanese government trying to get out ahead, perhaps, of its businesses and uh, doing something its businesses didn't necessarily uh, request. Um, now, uh, Sort of to connect that to this, the second question, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting sort of overlaps and partnerships, and the China one is uh, a really important one to, in terms of uh, Marco's question. But, you know, I mean, in terms, I think the way he framed it is like, yeah, I think he's absolutely correct. The narrative seems more about sustainability, connectivity, and it isn't, uh, it's mentioned, but it's not prominent in terms of the urban governance issue 
or at least the surveillance aspect of that. And, you know, if I was being flippant, I'd say, well, that's because there's no crime in Japan. This is what um, you, you really seldom see this feature in a lot of these documents. And I think, but I think obviously there is, it's an uncomfortable topic. Um, and I think also it's uncomfortable because of its connotations related to China um, and its use of surveillance technologies for all sorts of things. And of course, Japan, Japanese companies would like to push put themselves away and the Japanese government for sure. But the reality is that it's tight, quite tightly connected. I mean, just to take one big example is uh, SoftBank, um, you know, Masayoshi Son. He, he, he's dabbled a lot in AI applications in the China market. Um, he had a dalliance with uh, Alibaba for a while there. Um, you know, you, you can't quite separate him and his uh, sort of investments out from uh, the development of that technology that has been used for uh, surveillance. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of making a big accusation there, but there are these sorts of overlaps. Um, a second reason why I think that, that the surveillance and the crime aspect is uh, de-emphasized is because of the really, I mean, more than probably most places, of course, privacy is a big concern, but I think in Japan, the, the, the privacy aspect really is quite a sensitive one. And, you know, we even saw this a little bit in the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The government had, to a certain degree, quite a lot of sort of difficulties to trying to, um, well, they had a number of different, different difficulties, but one of them was the sort of justification of using these high-tech apps for surveillance that, for example, Singapore used and whatnot. And, you know, there was uh, very little uptake of the uh, surveillance apps for COVID-19 here. The vaccination thing, app that seemed to work okay, but some of the others weren't so widely embraced. And if they're not widely embraced, then they're not really worth anything. Uh, you need the data to make them work in the first place. So if there's not a lot of opt-in, then that's a big issue. So um, yeah, I think uh, the question is a really good one and that the government is very, at least very careful and cautious regarding uh, promoting the urban governance and the urban surveillance aspect of these technologies. Um, um, and, you know, if, the, if surveillance is an important thing, it's probably focused mostly on disaster risk, disaster management, uh, weather, all that sort of stuff, um, which to be fair is absolutely a, a big issue in Japan um, and a smart use of the technology for that. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, both are, were excellent questions. Thank you. Um, can I elicit uh, <clears throat> a very uh, brief, to the point, uh, response from all speakers uh, to an, an aspect that uh, Alice has already emphasized in her uh, insightful comments. <clears throat> we talk a lot about, of course, cooperation here in this panel, but um, as, as, as it has been made clear throughout this, uh, uh, this panel, there are, there are strong um, uh, economic and industrial policies incentives uh, uh, also uh, behind these connectivity initiatives, including in digital and smart city approaches. Um, and Alice has rightly pointed that first mover advantage. Um, so my question is, um, uh, within the European Union, uh, European Union member states themselves, uh, uh, of course, want to uh, harness uh, um, uh, these connectivity initiatives for the benefit of their industrial and national champions. Uh, Italy, interestingly enough, has published its own uh, um, free four-pager um, that spells out its contribution to the Indo-Pacific uh, um, a couple of months ago. It's on um, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs website. Uh, this is called the Italian Contribution to the EU's Indo-Pacific. Um, and it really spells out that uh, our engagement is about uh, us being a merchant nation and us uh, selling out, uh, sell, selling off and exporting our high-end technology. Which brings me to the question, um, how uh, easy is then to envision this kind of cooperation, not least because connectivity and uh, development aid uh, rests more and more on what is called private-public partnerships. And the fact that policy banks, uh, to go back to Alice's comments, uh, rely also on uh, essentially private interests. Um, and the policy banks such as JBIC, for instance, are there to give government guarantees. Um, 
this is a very complicated uh, if if you think about it, right? The cooperation between like-minded partners, because of course there is values, and of course there is like-minded uh, interests in uh, avoiding this. Uh, domination by one key actor. But then again, there are national interests and economic interests and even the economic composition uh, and the economic structure of uh, of uh, actors such as the EU, Japan and the US is different. I'll give you an example and I'll conclude. US-Japan cooperation looks very promising in the Indo-Pacific, but the economic actors that will benefit uh, are very different, right? Uh, Japan is mostly made up of really of small and medium enterprises, while the US is made up of big multinational companies. And I imagine that there are there are tensions there um, if we're talking about public-private uh, uh, partnerships. And so, in a nutshell, uh, and I'm sorry for taking up time, we can uh, 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 close it up uh, at uh, <clears throat> 1.40 with your approval. How do you envision uh, cooperation? How is cooperation possible, if at all? And uh, uh, I would like to actually ask uh, this question to all uh, uh, participants, including Alice. And uh, if uh, possible, shall we go in the order of a uh, uh, of the of the um, program? So Dai, Mike, uh, Corey, and Alice, and then uh, we'll close it off. Thank you. No, not okay. Al Al Alice has to leave. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, with uh, with your permission, Dai, Mike, and then Corey, if uh, if you have time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will. Look. Yeah, very good point about the tension between United States and Japan. Uh, there, I think, uh, possibly there is a tension between their uh, difference between uh, their approach, but the uh, it's a if we uh, pursue some kind of economic growth, uh, there there should be the competition. So basically, uh, two countries, or including two countries and uh, European countries and Japan, uh, cooperate between the development development of ASEAN or the other in the Pacific region. It should be the cooperate. And the uh, the other things, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we need a competition in economy. So I think that the detailed, more detailed cooperation, it should be the setting up the principle, how we can develop in the region, how we have to do the uh, projects for the, uh, these regions, that kind of principle we should agree. And then uh, private sector, even if the government, we have a competition in the in that area uh, in economy. So the, the best things is balanced approach between the cooperation and the competition. Thank you. We will uh, move to Alice very quickly because she has to leave and perhaps even just with salutations. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Alice. Yes, apologies that I can't really stay over time, but uh, I mean, I don't really have a straightforward answer to your point, Julio, but I do think it, you raised an interesting question, which is, uh, in the end, a public-private partnership really has a such a different uh, shape, whether we're dealing with a Google or with, uh, you know, a government-supported startup uh, in France, or then... Um, uh, a large group in one of the medium-sized countries, but it's still, uh, you know, one tiny, tiny portion of a, of a li uh, large uh, U.S., uh, for example, U.S. giant company. So I don't really have an answer to your question. I'm sorry. I, uh, I just uh, believe it's an interesting point that you're raising and that public-private partnership uh, is no uh, universal reality. It can take many different shapes, but that's certainly something to be uh, to be thinking about and researching more. Thank you very much, Alice, um, and thanks for your time today. Uh, Mike? Yes, well, I, I agree very much with uh, what Dai was just saying. I mean, in the economic sphere, it has to be competition. It cannot be otherwise, I think. But on, on development objectives and on standardization regulatory issues, there must be more coordination and synergies. I've actually 
quite intentionally avoided the word cooperation because I think that's one level further. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, finding synergies and coordinating, uh, and this is an exchange of what we are doing, knowing what each, uh, what, what both are doing, what objectives are, as a way of avoiding that we are duplicating. Because there's, uh, you know, we are all working with relatively limited funds. Um, so there's a need, I think, and a great benefit to coordination and cooperation. But, you know, if, if you look at the field of, of development, uh, for example, I've been studying digital uh, for development, which is now also increasingly more a focus in, in Brussels. Uh, you know, just recently, a Digital for Development Hub was created. And some people may suggest that, you know, well, this is an opportunity for JICA and then uh, this, this hub to cooperate. Uh, well, I beg to disagree because <laughs> if anything, you know, JICA, I think, is also a, it's a huge bureaucracy. It's a big tanker in and of itself where digitalization is, is relatively new, where, you know, people in JICA are trying to break the silos between, you know, the various sectors and, and, the, and, and, the, and the focus that they have trying to insert digitalization efforts in all of that. Um, and the same is, is, is actually the case in at, at the EU level, but also at the member states level, you know, speaking um, of the Netherlands, for example, as uh, you know, where I'm based. So in the midst of those that, those huge transformations that, that every country is going through to also aim for cooperation, you know, with companies from Japan or, um, you know, or Europe you know, working together in projects, I, I don't think that's, that's going to happen. We, if, if that was easy, we would have seen it with the EU-Japan Connectivity Partnership. And I think, you know, the few studies that we have seen out there about that partnership have shown that there's very, very little. So in that sense, I think we have to be more pragmatic. Um, that's not downsizing, you know, or, or lowering our ambitions, um, but it is aiming for a different approach that I think will be far more feasible. And um, if I may just use, you know, the, the, the last bit of time to engage with a question, a very good question that Alice also posed that I failed to answer, you know, the, the question of agency. Um, is, is this, is, is ASEAN a, a playground, as I indeed put it also in, in my paper? Yes, it is, um, just as Europe is a playground, by the way, but we're not talking about that now. Um, but ASEAN is, is, is a playground, but it's also a, a group of countries where in this field we can learn quite a lot from. You know, in Singapore, the level of technical expertise within government is just amazing. And here in Europe, we've, we've considered that to be sort of industrial policy, mercantilist practices that we should steer away from. Well, actually, I think we are reconsidering that now. Because, for example, when the COVID app was supposed to be designed in the Netherlands, you know, the government wanted to move in this direction and it did not have the technical experts in house. So how, how are you ever going to put out sort of a, a, a you know, a, a public, you know, quest for help with building this app if you cannot really, you know, assess what um you know what the technicalities are behind that so we are re reappreciating the you know the technical expertise of government officials and this is something you know frankly speaking again where we can learn a lot um just as in you know some of the very exciting things that are happening in the digital economy in these countries that you know we don't see here everybody here has a bank account in europe so you know having a digital access to a bank uh, you know to, or actually to your finances not through a bank Bank is something we cannot imagine but that's the exciting world that's happening uh, you know that the people in Southeast Asia live in and we have to be more aware and more understanding I think of that before we you know can do better even thank you very much Maike um Corey uh, well, the final word is yours I think yeah I mean is, is cooperation possible I mean like I mean it's both a hard yes and a hard no in the sense that it's like in the smart city sphere right now, it's the wild, wild west, well, maybe east in this part of the world. Like, uh, there's cooperation, but there's you know incredible competition. There's complementarity. There's all sorts of things going on. There's private to private sector cooperation, banks cooperating with major technology companies. You've got uh, multilateral development banks and uh, development agencies cooperating with governments, with private sector agencies. You've got, um, you know local government agencies cooperating with other local government agencies at the subnational level as well um, both you know promoted by the central government but even just on their own initiative in a lot of these spheres so uh you know i mean f for me in terms of my overall presentation and so forth 
the the economic security focus is 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 interesting and it makes sense on the sort of face of it but you know if you put too much emphasis on self-reliance and trying to control this and co call it corporation whatever it is these dynamic sort of interactions between all of these different agents then you know, I, I wonder if you end up doing more harm um, than good if you try and uh, exert too much influence over the direction that these uh, technologies go and the types of cooperation that grow out of them. So, yeah, it's, it is exciting, though, and uh, I, I really am looking forward to continuing to work on this project. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Corey, uh, Mike, Dai, uh, Alice. Uh, in fact, we will continue this very conversation on the role of uh, <clears throat> economic statecraft and of uh, techno-economic statecraft with uh, the next panel, which will start uh, in um, a little uh, more than 20 minutes. So do uh, um, connect this one is going to uh, um, happen via Zoom, so you would have to have registered. If you haven't done so, please register. And we have a still a lineup of speakers, uh, including uh, the co-organizer of this conference, uh, Timing Chong, who will be joined by um, um, William Norris from Texas A&M University, who will talk about Chinese perspectives on uh, economic statecraft, uh, and uh, Vinod Agarwal and Andrew uh, Reddy from Berkeley uh, on the U.S. embrace, uh, new embrace, uh, if you want, uh, um, past uh, five, six years uh, of uh, uh, geostrategic and uh, uh, geoeconomic uh, statecraft. We will focus on uh, uh, technology, and then we will have also Christy Govella from the German Marshall Fund uh, acting as a discussant. Um, that session will be uh, chaired by the co-leader of uh, the EU Asia project that has started in uh, January of 2021, Ken Endo, and uh, I very much look forward uh, to continue this conversation. Um, thank you very much, guys, for being here. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.